Francis Parkman Jr. September 16, 1823 to November 8, 1893, was an American historian, best known as author of The Oregon Trail, Sketches of Prairie and Rocky Mountain Life, and his monumental seven-volume France and England in North America. These works are still valued as historical sources and as literature. He was also a leading horticulturist, briefly a professor of horticulture at Harvard University and author of several books on the topic. Parkman was a trustee of the Boston Athenaeum from 1858 until his death in 1893. Biography <inaudible> 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 Early life Parkman was born in Boston, Massachusetts to the Reverend Francis Parkman Sr. (1788–1853), a member of a distinguished Boston family, and Caroline Hall Parkman. The senior Parkman was minister of the Unitarian New North Church in Boston from 1813 to 1849. As a young boy, Frank Parkman was found to be of poor health, and was sent to live with his maternal grandfather, who owned a 3,000-acre tract of wilderness in nearby Medford, Massachusetts, in the hopes that a more rustic lifestyle would make him more sturdy. In the four years he stayed there, Parkman developed his love of the forests, which would animate his historical research. Indeed, he would later summarize his books as, The History of the American Forest. He learned how to sleep and hunt, and could survive in the wilderness like a true pioneer. He later even learned to ride bareback, a skill that would come in handy when he found himself living with the Sioux. Education and career Parkman enrolled at Harvard College at age 16. In his second year he conceived the plan that would become his life's work. In 1843, at the age of 20, he traveled to Europe for eight months in the fashion of the Grand Tour. Parkman made expeditions through the Alps and the Apennine Mountains, climbed Vesuvius, and lived for a time in Rome, where he befriended Passionist monks who tried, unsuccessfully, to convert him to Catholicism. Upon graduation in 1844, he was persuaded to get a law degree, his father hoping such study would rid Parkman of his desire to write his history of the forests. It did no such thing, and after finishing law school Parkman proceeded to fulfill his great plan. His family was somewhat appalled at Parkman's choice of life work, since at the time writing histories of the American wilderness was considered ungentlemanly. Serious historians would study ancient history, or after the fashion of the time, the Spanish Empire. Parkman's works became so well received that by the end of his lifetime histories of early America had become the fashion. Theodore Roosevelt dedicated his four-volume History of the Frontier, The Winning of the West 1889 to Parkman. In 1846, Parkman traveled west on a hunting expedition, where he spent a number of weeks living with the Sioux tribe, at a time when they were struggling with some of the effects of contact with Europeans, such as epidemic disease and alcoholism. This experience led Parkman to write about American Indians with a much different tone from earlier, more sympathetic portrayals represented by the noble savage stereotype. Writing in the era of Manifest Destiny, Parkman believed that the conquest and displacement of American Indians represented progress, a triumph of civilization over savagery, a common view at the time. He was elected a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1855, and in 1865 was elected a member of the American Antiquarian Society. With the Civil War concluding, Parkman, along with Boston Athenaeum librarian William F. Poole and fellow trustees Donald McKay Frost and Raymond Sanger Wilkins, saw the importance of securing, for the benefit of future historians, newspapers, broadsides, books, and pamphlets printed in the Confederate States of America. Thanks to Parkman's foresight, the Boston Athenaeum is home to one of the most extensive collections of Confederate imprints in the world. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Personal life. A scion of a wealthy Boston family, Parkman had enough money to pursue his research without having to worry too much about finances. His financial stability was enhanced by his modest lifestyle, and later, by the royalties from his book sales. He was thus able to commit much of his time to research, as well as to travel. 
He traveled across North America, visiting most of the historical locations he wrote about, and made frequent trips to Europe seeking original documents with which to further his research. Parkman's accomplishments are all the more impressive in light of the fact that he suffered from a debilitating neurological illness, which plagued him his entire life, and which was never properly diagnosed. He was often unable to walk, and for long periods he was effectively blind, being unable to see but the slightest amount of light. Much of his research involved having people read documents to him, and much of his writing was written in the dark, or dictated to others. Parkman married Catherine Scolay Bigelow on May 13, 1850, they had three children. A son died in childhood, and shortly afterwards, his wife died. He successfully raised two daughters, introducing them into Boston society and seeing them both wed, with families of their own. Parkman died at age 70 in Jamaica Plain. He is buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Parkman also is known for being one of the founders, in 1879, and first president of Boston's St. Botolph Club, a social club which focuses on arts and literature. Legacy Parkman is one of the most notable nationalist historians. In recognition of his talent and accomplishments, the Society for American Historians annually awards the Francis Parkman Prize for the Best Book on American History. His work has been praised by historians who have published essays in new editions of his work by such Pulitzer Prize winners as C. Van Woodward, Alan Nevins, and Samuel Eliot Morrison as well as by other notable historians including Wilbur R. Jacobs, John Keegan, William Taylor, Mark Van Doren, and David Levin. Famous artists such as Thomas Hart Benton and Frederick Remington have illustrated Parkman's books. Numerous translations have been published worldwide. In 1865 Parkman built a house at 50 Chestnut Street on Beacon Hill in Boston, which has since become a National Historic Landmark. The Francis Parkman School in Forest Hills bears his name, as does Parkman Drive and the granite Francis Parkman Memorial at the site of his last home in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts now a neighborhood of Boston. On September 16, 1967, the United States Postal Service honored Parkman with a prominent American Series 3 postage stamp with the wording, Francis Parkman American Historian U.S. Postage. Criticism <coughs> 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 Parkman's work regarding nationality, race, and especially Native Americans has generated criticism. C. Van Woodward wrote that Parkman permitted his bias to control his judgment, employed the trope of national character to color sketches of French and English, and drew a distinction between Indian savagery and settler civilization, for Parkman found the Indian practice of scalping appalling, and made sure to underscore his aversion. The French-trained historian W. J. Eccles harshly criticized what he perceived as Parkman's bias against France and Roman Catholic policies, as well as what he considered Parkman's misuse of French language sources, although he gives scant evidence of this last. Noted Eccles, Francis Parkman's epic work La Salle and the Discovery of the Great West Boston, 1869, is doubtless a great literary work, but, as history, it is, to say the least of dubious merit. However, other Canadian contemporaries laud Parkman's work as a veritable mine of brilliantly comprehensive history of early Canadian events and personages. Unlike Eccles, many modern historians have found much to praise in Parkman's work, even while recognizing his limitations. The historian Robert S. Allen has said that Parkman's history of France and England in North America remains a rich mixture of history and literature which few contemporary scholars can hope to emulate." The historian Michael N. McConnell, while acknowledging the historical errors and racial prejudice in Parkman's book The Conspiracy of Pontiac, has said, Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 it would be easy to dismiss Pontiac as a curious, perhaps embarrassing, artifact of another time and place. Yet Parkman's work represents a pioneering effort, in several ways he anticipated the kind of frontier history now taken for granted. Parkman's masterful and evocative use of language remains his most enduring and instructive legacy. 
The American literary critic Edmund Wilson, in his book O Canada, described Parkman's France and England in North America in these terms. The clarity, the momentum, and the color of the first volumes of Parkman's narrative are among the most brilliant achievements of the writing of history as an art. Gallery Selected works The Oregon Trail The Conspiracy of Pontiac and the Indian War after the Conquest of Canada Two Vols, 1851 Vassal Morton 1856, a novel The Book of Roses 1866. Horticulture of Roses France and England in North America 1865-1892 the Pioneers of France in the New World 1865. The Jesuits in North America in the 17th century 1867. La Salle and the Discovery of the Great West 1869, Expanded Edition, 1879. The Old Regime in Canada 1874. Count Frontenac and New France under Louis XIV 1877. Montcalm and Wolfe 1884. A Half Century of Conflict 1892. Historic Handbook of the Northern Tour 1885. The Journals of Francis Parkman, 2 vols. Edited by Mason Wade. New York, Harper, 1947. The Letters of Francis Parkman, 2 vols. Edited by Wilbur R. Jacobs. Norman, U of Oklahoma p. 1960. The Battle for North America. A one-volume abridgment of France and England in North America, edited by John Tebble. Doubleday 1948. Articles The Ancient Regime in Canada, 1663–1763. PDF. The North American Review. 118 243 225 to 255 April 1874 JSTOR 25109812 Reviewed works The Native Races of the Pacific States of North America PDF The North American Review 120 246 34 to 47 January 1875 JSTOR 25109883. Cavalier de la Salle. PDF. The North American Review. 125, 259, 427 to 438. November 1877. JSTOR 25110131. The Failure of Universal Suffrage. PDF. The North American Review. 127 263 1 to 20 July 1878 JSTOR 25100650 The Woman Question PDF The North American Review 129 275 303 to 321 October 1879 JSTOR 25100797 the Woman Question Again. PDF. The North American Review. 130, 278, 16 to 30. January 1880. JSTOR 25100823. Albert Benedict Wolfe, ed. 1916. Some of the Reasons Against Woman Suffrage. Readings in Social Problems. Ginn and Company. p. 478 to 481. See also The Knickerbocker George Parkman — Uncle Henri Raymond Casgrain